Fantastic. Okay, officially, welcome everyone to the Center for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh virtual seminar series on the future of law in technology and governance. What a mouthful that is. I am Mike Madison. I am your host and coordinator of the virtual series. I am a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh, which you can see in my background on Zoom. And my job today is mostly to welcome you all and especially to welcome our speaker and presenter, Charlotte Scheider from Loyola University in Chicago, who is an expert in health law, data privacy, artificial intelligence and public policy, and a variety of really interesting and cool things. And she has a paper that called Humans Outside the Loop, uh, which uh, was recently accepted for publication in the Yale Journal of Law and Technology. And uh, she's gonna present to us today. Charlotte's gonna give a talk for give or take 30 minutes. Uh, and at that point, I will moderate a Q&A. So I'm going to mute myself. I'd ask everybody else if you haven't already to mute yourselves. And I'm going to say thank you, Charlotte, and away you go. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for inviting me. Um, you know, it's just such a pleasure to really be with all of you today. And the timing is kind of funny. I, I was saying before others were joining that, you know, we kind of have a sweet spot after the semester has ended, but before grading begins. So I, I'm just really pleased that you're here sharing that with me. So thank you so much for the invitation. You know, I, I've been thinking for a long time about artificial intelligence. I started thinking about this related to healthcare policy um, back in 2015. And it feels like that's just yesterday, but ultimately, you know, we're now coming up on pretty close to a decade of thinking about this really in practice. But a lot of folks are kind of new to this particular area, prompted, I think, in a lot of ways by generative AI and what that has the possibility to do for us. And I like to think of AI a little bit more expansively, including AI applications that could include, for example, um, embodiments of AI, where AI is driving uh, different robotics, uh, AI involved in medical devices, AI involved in self-driving cars or delivery vehicles, um, and a variety of other applications. I, I think the most important thing as we come into this is to think about AI very expansively that it really could be used in almost any application in which decisions are being made today. And that makes it very interesting and unusual from a regulatory perspective. Um, and I'll kind of jump in to kind of show you why I'm concerned about the tort perspective, but certainly tort is part of a broader consideration related to regulation and how we really should be establishing expectations in this space. Now, I know that this is a mixed attendance, so I'm not going to go into the, the heavy, heavy law stuff so much, but I know we do have some law professors here and, you know, and I encourage you to ask any questions that, that you'd like at the end. Okay, so I usually start this presentation by showing you a picture of a Tesla. Um, this Tesla was on auto drive. And in this particular case, the driver took their hands off the wheel for about two seconds. Um, the car behaved in a way that was relatively unexpected, um, went off of an overpass, ran into some trees, started on fire. Um, and this is one of many different cases that we've seen recently. I want to say there are between five and six now. I don't know the exact number um, related to Tesla specifically. And in all of those cases, the plaintiff who took their hands off the wheel for brief seconds in pretty much every case, only just a couple seconds. So, you know, not driving extensively with auto drive on or anything like that. Um, but in all of those cases, Tesla um, had the positive outcome. So the defendant um, won out in these cases. And the basis for that was because Tesla had included in its user manual references to autopilot and stating that when you're using autopilot, um, you have to keep your hands on the steering wheel at all times and maintain control of your car. Now, the reality is that the way that autopilot was, um, I guess, let's say marketed, uh, just the logical conclusion when you think that you're using autopilot. I also happen to have friends who have Teslas who have autopilot and the way that they use autopilot, um, just the general expectation is that you are able to take your hands off the wheel for a brief moment. Um, and that typically when you're thinking about something like this, you're not thinking that you have to 
observe and control every aspect of the AI while it's functioning. In fact, the whole purpose of this particular application was so that you would have the ability to, for a brief moment, do something in your car without worrying about some major problem occurring. But uniformly across the board, what we've seen is that um, pretty much all of these cases have been invalidated based on this language that I'm showing you right now in the owner's manual, as well as uh, limitations on liability in contracts associated with autopilot. Now, what folks in AI will tell you, and I've been to a lot of AI conferences where people say this, autopilot is not AI, at least fully autonomous AI. But what's very interesting is if you look and listen to Elon Musk and Elon Musk's um, representations related to, auto to autopilot before it was on the road, was that all of these limitations were simply for the lawyers and that ultimately this was a product that was ready to be used. Um, nevertheless, um, we only have one case, a very recent case, where judges have been willing to consider that sort of uh, relationship between the intrinsic function of autopilot and the representations made alongside it as a way of overcoming the presumption that there is no liability on Tesla's part here. So we know that this is an issue. Now, this is just one example. This paper is not about self-driving vehicles, um, but rather just illustrates that this is the kind of issue that we are likely to encounter because a lot of really creative and excellent lawyers, and it would probably be me if I was advising a company too, um, do what they can to insulate an organization from liability. So we can expect that this is going to continue um, to occur. So why do we want humans in the loop? Um, well, many of you may be aware of a lot of the, the functional issues um, you know, related to AI. In particular, we have a lot of complexity in the newer implementations of AI. So we're talking about neural networks and deep learning applications. And I've, I've showed you some examples here of how AI can be applied. Um, when we're talking about neural networks, we have input layers that are fed into a variety of additional uh, layers where decisions are occurring and then fed into another layer. So just by means of example, this application here on the right uh, that shows a, a skin mole. Uh, I actually met with the leader um, who created this particular AI and they told me that they had 1000 hidden layers um, of decisions that were made in order to effectively create an AI that can diagnose um, skin cancer. Now, the reality is that you are not supposed to rely on this particular AI. Um, you are really supposed to see your doctor, uh, but we know that there are people who would ultimately do this, um, who would rely on that particular application. But because we have so many hidden layers, it's very hard for a person to interrogate the quality of the AI, to know how good those decisional layers um, are functioning, to know what data are fed into them, to know anything about the AI structure itself. And one thing that this presentation does not go into a lot of detail about, but I think is very relevant and is part of another paper that I'm working on, is the role of confidentiality and trade secrecy as a means of protecting disclosure of a lot of those details. So let's presume that one of the users of any one of these technologies that I have um, listed here uh, was in a position to actually interrogate the quality of the AI. The reality is that that degree of information would not be made available to them in part because a lot of these technologies um, benefit from a great deal of confidentiality um, and may not be eligible for alternative uh, intellectual property protections that we, that we might have previously used for these types of technologies. So you can see here that AI is being used in a lot of different varieties of, of places. In the top right, we have the new um, cyber truck that's been developed by Tesla, uh, ChatGPT with a lot, which a lot of people know about. Um, there are a lot of generative AI, um, but ChatGPT is kind of the biggest one right now. Uh, nuclear facilities have been an interest area where we think that we can increase safety to some degree, as well as personal robotics um, and a variety of consumer products. Most of us are interacting with AI right now and don't really know it. Let's see if I can make this change. Aha, okay. So what are some of the types of humans in the loop? Well, I've categorized these into kind of four buckets um, just to help, I think, frame the conversation about what humans in the loop look like. The first one, probably the lowest touch, is what we call supervision. So we've put a human in the loop to watch things as they're happening. Um, a great example of that would be in something like a nuclear facility, 
where you have folks who, you know, are specially trained in that particular area. They know how, uh, you know, nuclear products are supposed to function. And they have some sense of kind of what it looks like when things go awry. Now, supervision, of course, is not restricted to experts, but certainly could be the method that we use um, to sort of ensure that AI is functioning as it should. Now, the effect of that, of course, is that, you know, if a human does not intervene, so they're supervising, they see something going wrong, the presumption is that they're going to do something about it if something goes wrong. So that's where we jump down to the intervention uh, categorization, which is op often combined with supervision, where a human will actually step in and change what is happening in that scenario. For example, stopping a system, um, correcting the vehicle that's you know, swerving off of the on-ramp, um, but that the human is going to do something about it. So the question remains, what happens when a human doesn't do the thing that they are supposed to do to correct the behavior of the technology? Does that then mean that that human is at fault in that system and that the company that created that particular product or that particular system is insulated from liability? Um, I think that that is a potential real, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing in the cases, um, impact of the model of the human in the loop today. We also have a review function. And this is the type of thing that we're seeing with a lot of the content moderation activities with some of the uh, generative AI functions. Um, but also what we're seeing as we're applying AI, for example, to the practice of law, to the practice of medicine, um, to a lot of professional functions, where the expectation is that a human is looking at whatever the AI spits out and making corrections as needed. Now, this presumes, again, that somebody knows enough to know how to correct and sort of what to do in those particular uh, situations. A lot of the products that are being used in this way have disclaimers that say things like, you know, you can't just uh, defer to whatever the AI has told you. You have the responsibility of using these responsibly, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually how we've thought about um, regulation in uh, the medical field as well as the legal field. And then the, the final categorization that I think is really interesting is this concept of human machine collaboration. And collaboration is a much more time intensive a functional kind of a characteristic in category where a human is actually working alongside a computer. Now, the challenge, of course, with collaboration, especially in the AI function, is that the presumption with collaboration is that to some degree, there may not be equality, but there certainly is some sharing of responsibility and some sharing of information. So for example, a human that is supervising an AI system they know very little about is probably not in collaboration with that AI system. We presume that in collaboration, you have two functions that are complementary um, and that to some degree are designed for that function. Um, often when we talk about human, uh, human computer collaboration today, we don't really mean that. We ultimately mean a human in the loop in one of these other categorizations. So I really like this article. I know that Mike has seen it before, uh, but it makes, me, it makes me laugh because this is really how I think about a human in the loop. The idea that sometimes a human can really be, um, you know, very effective from an intervention perspective. They ultimately could correct a lot of really significant situations. But in some cases, a human may actually mismeasure or mischaracterize what is happening and ultimately make this, the situation worse um, or prevent a machine from working as it's intended. Um, and this particular article was written based on navigational systems in, um, in space navigation. Um, but we've seen many examples of this related to uh, aircraft navigation, et cetera. Um, and part of the challenge is this idea, and I've highlighted it here, that when properly prepared, um, individuals might be able to intervene or might be able to collaborate effectively. I think one of the challenges we have today is that AI is designed in such a way where we're kind of throwing a human at it without designing it with the idea that a human is supposed to be in collaboration with it. Um, and I'll talk about here in a little bit where I think that this is where uh, user interface design, UX, human factors, HCI, a lot of these really great complementary areas can be very, very effective but we may need to create some obligation related to that if a human will be in the loop. So what are some of the risks of humans in the loop? 
Um, well, the first one I think I've, I've already mentioned already, you know, we may over rely on humans. Um, and when humans don't fully understand a process, it means that they might be effective or they might be really ineffective. Um, they may interrupt an otherwise effective process. And ultimately, if we permit humans to be in the loop as a means for absorbing liability, it means that we may not get to a regulatory model that is particularly useful. Um, and I, I say a stopgap because at least in technology, we often talk about a stopgap as kind of like the Band-Aid solution. The thing that, is, that does not solve the problem, but ultimately you know, gives us a little bit of time to figure it out. Um, what I'm seeing in the industry is that we are putting humans in the middle of everything because we're not exactly sure how the technology is functioning. And we're not sure how safe it is. Um, and I think my concern is that if we continue to work in this way, we're going to develop an expectation that humans really can effectively work in this kind of a model. And I think that that's dangerous for a variety of reasons. Um, today, what we're seeing is that humans are really not trained to interact with AI effectively. And I'll say this, um, you know, even in the healthcare space where there have been, I would say, a lot more investments in training, um, take, for example, surgical robotics where individuals who are operating surgical robots um, receive a great deal of training. Um, in that situation, still challenging a surgical robot when you're doing microsurgery is a very challenging kind of thing. You know, you are relying on the device to some extent to behave as you expect it to behave. And when you're working in, you know, micro degrees of surgical applications, it is possible something could go very, very wrong. And that's often difficult to know when things are going wrong. And finally, um, humans may defer to technology when they don't have equivalent expertise, which, as I've mentioned, is most of the time. Um, and this is part in part because many times people are trained in ways where they are, you know, doing something completely different than the work that a data scientist does. Um, and in fact, most data scientists that are creating a lot of these applications themselves don't understand all of the details about what's happening. Um, you know, rather, we're looking at the results of setting up um, an effective AI system, an effective AI model, and looking to kind of the results of what has been developed to determine how well or how poorly it's working. And so when we defer to technology, um, and even when we have equivalent expertise, uh, you know, we may actually make the wrong decision. And the question is then, is it the fault of the human or is it the fault of the developer of the AI? So this is just one example um, that we've seen in the medical space, which is the inclusion of AI in uh, insulin systems, including um, ongoing monitoring, as well as insulin pumps that deliver insulin to the body. So we are dependent, uh, those, and I, I don't personally use one, but I know a lot of people who do use insulin pumps. Um, we are dependent on an individual challenging what the system is recommending. Um, we have now an artificial pancreas that I believe is in its final steps of FDA approval that basically functions almost completely automated um, in almost every respect. Basically, it sends a message to a mobile device that says, this is what we're going to do. You know, we recommend that we deliver this amount of insulin at this time. And you have the ability as an individual to say no. But how does a person who is dependent on a medical device know that their body is in a particular circumstance or not in a particular circumstance where they can make that assessment? Um, I would contend that it's very, very difficult to do that. And when we take, for example, the medical space, we have a very different model of liability because of regulations we have over medical devices. Um, and already we have a lot of insulation from liability due to what we call the learned intermediary doctrine, which is where a doctor who is implementing a particular um, device with a person, that that person is responsible for explaining how the system will work to cue that individual in on what the risks are. And so any information related to training, any information related to the product is actually not something on the basis of which that patient would be able to sue that manufacturer if something were to go wrong. Um, and so we have a lot of really interesting liability models that when you include AI in, in this space become highly problematic. 
So one of the shifts that I try to, um, to introduce in this paper, but I've tried to introduce in other papers too, is the importance of humans functions outside of the decisional loop. Meaning that there are many, many things that humans can do to make AI safe. Um, and some of these are the roles of data scientists. Some of these are the role of engineers. Some of these are the roles of specialists that are reviewing um, you know, early outputs of AI models and sort of validating them against their own expertise. But there is a lot that we can do ultimately to create better AI. And I think that sometimes when we hear AI and we hear that it's this, you know, for example, a deep learning model and it's very, very complex and we focus in on the algorithm, we forget all of the other things that go into creating the algorithm, evaluating the algorithm, ongoing testing of the algorithm and improving it. Um, part of why I think that ChatGPT has been um, improving as much as it has is because it's exposed to the public, meaning that everybody's using it, everybody's, you know, in very big headlines, identifying problems with it, which are then fed into the conversation of what's going to be included in the next, um, in the next uh, version that's going to come out for ChatGPT. I think that there might be ways that we can expose a lot more of AI and in ways that don't necessarily compromise models um, you know, related to cyber attacks and, and the like. So what are some of the things that humans outside the loop can do? Um, well, they can be involved in data selection and structure. We know that that is a very, very important part of um, eliminating bias, is making sure that you have representative contextual data that is fed into the AI um, in a volume that is useful for whatever application you have. Um, the overall AI type that you're choosing, what kind of model and structure you're going to use, what your training approach, your testing, and even your tuning steps are going to be. Um, this is not a linear process. Uh, this is about as iterative as one can get. A lot of us who have worked in the technology space are familiar with agile methodologies. AI is like agile on steroids. You know, the, the amount of loops that have to occur, and when I say loops, I don't mean decisional loops, but just iterative loops are really um, exceptional, I think, in a lot of ways. I was working with a company uh, doing some consulting on uh, a coronary artery disease uh, diagnostic app. And they were working with the FDA trying to get the best result that, that they could. And they had reached a point where it was about 95% um, effective. And the FDA said, well, 95% is not enough. We needed to reach you know, 98%. And the number of iterations and times that that team had to work on it to try and get to 98% was truly remarkable. Um, and ultimately, in the end, they could not get it to be that effective. So part of the challenge in this space is that it's not extremely clear how we get to a particular result, but we know that all of the inputs are the types of things that humans have to make decisions about and be involved um, in evaluating and making determinations about. The other thing I'll mention that we kind of tend to forget about is the importance of infrastructure and um, you know, overall supportive processes that are implemented by these organizations. And AI is not just an algorithm. Um, we're talking about physical hardware, we're talking about software applications, we're talking about relationships with third parties, um, database structure. The kinds of things that maybe to folks who study AI are maybe not that you know, exciting, but are really central to the function, the effectiveness and the performance of AI. And probably most importantly, humans are crucial to providing feedback on AI. Um, you know, and this means experts in some cases, it means people who are familiar with how the AI is functioning, and it means regular people. Um, we've seen this kind of a model in the EU, uh, not related to AI, but related to privacy practices. And I think that there might be a way to sort of inject individuals, kind of real people who might use AI into the process of tuning and improving without necessarily um, exposing to the public, um, at least early in the process. And so ultimately humans are essential to AI. So when I say that we need to move away from humans in the loop as sort of a default, I don't mean that humans are not important. Humans are centrally important. I think we just need to focus on how we most effectively include humans in that process. So why does this matter for tort law? 
Um, well, the starting point that I'm thinking about, especially with this background of the cases that we're seeing, is that without an AI law or some other regulatory intervention, um, we expect that potential harms will likely be examined in tort law. Um, we might also see it alternatively in contract, but because um, especially for embodied AI, we're expecting there might be some kind of physical injury or some property damage, we're likely to fall into the tort law space. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with tort law, tort law is the law of wrongs. So the idea is about allocating sort of who is responsible in a given situation. In some situations, that might really mean that the human or the consumer or the person using a product is ultimately in the wrong. Uh, we call that a comparative negligence scheme that's in the majority of, of states now. Um, but in a lot of cases, that person is not really well positioned to challenge how the technology is working. And organizations that uh, sell these products, whether it's in a business to business scenario where they're licensing a product to another business or a business to consumer um, or customer relationship where they're selling it direct to a person. In all of these situations, organizations use a variety of warnings, um, contractual provisions that insulate that organization from liability. Um, create, for example, even in B2B relationships, uh, liquidated damages provisions that set a ceiling for how much somebody can recover if something goes wrong. Um, and as we saw in the Tesla example, user manuals that are highly restrictive um, that sort of frustrate the purpose for why you're using the AI in the first place. So we know that there are a lot of ways that organizations are trying to shift risk onto downstream players. And ultimately, we can expect this to continue, um, continue to occur. Now, part of the challenge, I think, is that it's very, very difficult to anticipate and understand what some of the safety issues could be. Now, one of the things about relying on contractual provisions is that if both of the organizations have some sense of what could go wrong, we presume that they would be able to allocate, allocate risk in a way that is um, efficient between them. Meaning if there are more risks, maybe you pay less money. Um, if there are fewer risks, maybe you pay more money. Um, if somebody's going to give you uh, greater warranty um, commitments in those situations, maybe you would pay more money. But we expect that organizations are able to sort of allocate those risks in a discretionary way. Now we know with consumers, of course, that they're not usually in a bargaining position where they can do this effectively. One of the challenges, however, is that with artificial intelligence, that information diffusion, so how much information about risk is available, ultimately is not available for anybody. The only organization that really knows very much about how it's functioning is the organization that is selling or licensing the product, um, or maybe you know, offering it for acquisition if we're talking about um, you know, an organization purchasing the business. And so reasonably avoiding AI harms and ultimately being compensated for injuries may be very nearly impossible. And we have to kind of figure out, is this the kind of model that we ultimately want for AI? Um, I am a very pro-innovation person, but I also worry that if we're in a situation where the organizations using AI ultimately are always ending up absorbing that risk, over time, will this result actually in less utilization of AI? Um, this paper does not talk about innovation policy, but I think it's worth mentioning. So this is a, a visual that, that I created just to sort of help to think about the variety of ways in which um, you know, information diffusion about the AI itself may be less available to potential plaintiffs. You can see here that in the center, we have an AI development company. Um, to be clear, a lot of AI development companies are very small. Uh, many of them are startups. Some of them are research organizations that are part of a university. And often one of their primary goals is either to license their product or to make it available for acquisition. So you can see in that first ring that ultimately you're already one step away from that initial information. Um, a lot of uh, acquisitions that involve AI do not involve acquiring from an organization that very um, clearly understands how the AI works. So we already have sort of one step away when we're taking that next level. Um, often that organization then is uh, licensing or selling potentially to another business function, uh, another business user, or maybe even another company. And ultimately it makes it to an end user or a consumer pretty far downstream. 
but the degree of information about the AI design, how, you know, exactly what data goes into that function, how the model is created um, from a bias perspective, what counterfactuals were, were, were run, um, the degree of control over live AI. So if the AI is actually being licensed, that may be managed and operated by that AI development company and, and ultimately used in sort of a software as a service kind of a model with other organizations. And even the degree of AI knowledge. I think there's this presumption that if we have an AI development company and there's a company that's interested in purchasing them or licensing, that they would have some ability to sort of fact check or evaluate um, that product. But ultimately, because AI is such a niche area, at least right now, um, we don't have a lot of diffusion of AI knowledge or the tools to adequately evaluate um, AI. And I include this just to sort of illustrate that even when we're talking about data, so all of the data that goes into these systems, many of those data will be personal information. And so we have this whole other problem related to privacy and sort of how data are used on the back end. And I just used an example here of healthcare that is supposed to be overwhelming <laughs> to illustrate that you can see every single one of these lines involves sharing of data. Imagine if each one of these entities was also using AI and using personal information within their particular applications, how challenging that would be for a doctor or a patient to even understand that. So we know that not just from a safety perspective or an effectiveness perspective, but also from a privacy perspective, from a bias perspective, um, that we have a lot of issues related to information diffusion. Okay, so the recommendations that I'm making in this paper, um, I'll, I'll first say that there's only so much time, even with a very lengthy law review paper, and, and those of you who, who don't work in the law space, you know, you'll probably look at this paper and be like, man, that's really long. Um, but even with that amount of time, I'm just starting to scratch the surface of what I think a model could look like. Um, and I'm anticipating that I'll be writing another paper that's more in detail about a regulatory approach. But here are just at least some initial thoughts that I have. One of them is that from a tort perspective, software is not clearly in one categorization of tort. Um, we have a model that's called negligence that we use for sort of all wrongs um, in tort that do not involve intentionality. And we also have a categorization called products liability, which is usually focused on embodied, um, embodied products, right? Physical things, the, the types of things that um, for those of you in the legal community, you would assume would be on the UCC side, right? Tangible, movable things. Typically, that's how we think about products liability versus negligence. But software and computer products in general fall into both. And often we go on a state-by-state -state basis to determine whether or not products liability is actually available for software. So what we're anticipating will happen is that, excuse me, Embodied AI is probably going to go down a products liability path and disembodied AI, so like virtual AI, like ChatGPT will go down a regular negligence path. The problem is that the AI could be the same. And actually this is what we anticipate is that a lot of AI will be used and developed for a variety of different purposes and included in some products and in other cases, um, you know, in a, in a virtual scenario. So we have no consistency, which is problematic. Um, also from a negligence perspective, we have some issues that are more, um, now it's not that they don't exist in products liability, but I'll say they are more intractable in a negligence model, which are issues of foreseeability. So foreseeability from a legal perspective means that you have to have envisioned to some degree what the foreseeability of potential risks will be to determine how to protect a person from a potential wrong occurring from some injury occurring. So if we're analyzing whether or not somebody fulfilled or did not fulfill their duty, whether they fulfilled it or they breached it, a big part of that is anticipating what could happen. If you don't know from an AI perspective what could happen, and in fact, what we know from an AI perspective is that there are a lot of behaviors of AI that are really unanticipated and hard to um, really expect from design. Um, for example, let's, let's use Tesla, um, if that was in a negligence model, the idea that the car would suddenly veer off the road in a matter of two seconds is something that likely was unanticipated by the designers um, of, of that auto drive feature. 
So that can be kind of difficult, right? That might help somebody um, actually escape liability by claiming, well, we didn't know what the AI was going to do. We couldn't have anticipated that. Um, in products liability, it's slightly different. Foreseeability is still an important part of it, but we're focused more on products liability, at least for one of the types of products liability claims, a design claim, on what is the best design for the purpose that balances the advantages of the design over the risks. So usually what happens in products liability is that a plaintiff has to demonstrate that there is an alternative design. Now, the reality is that, um, you know, if there are a variety of competing products out there, you might be able to illustrate that there actually is a reasonable alternative design related to this particular kind of product that is less risky. Or you might be able to point out different characteristics, um, at least by including experts in the process. Uh, now, this will, of course, mean that there has to be some information about that product that is available in a court of law that's available through discovery and other things. Um, so there are some interesting challenges here. I also think that there might be something here. It's not really included too much in the paper, but I'm thinking of adding this in, which is related to uh, language about potential risks. So the labeling function, the, the failure to warn potential argument under products liability with the idea that if people don't know that AI is being used, they don't know anything about the system, that that might be in and of itself a basis for a claim. Um, in order to at least put a person in a position where they know something more, you have to provide them with a fair amount of information. Okay. Um, and one of the good things about tort is that ultimately it can provide compensation. So if we are able to eliminate some of the roadblocks, for example, by barring limitations on liability, um, examining really unbalanced liquidated damages provisions, um, really focusing on user manual limitations that are really contrary to the purpose and their marketed use. If we're able to sort of get beyond that, we might be in a situation where we can actually compensate people who really have been harmed. And especially with AI, those could be very, very serious types of injuries that would otherwise go uncompensated. But I don't think that tort is the only way to do this. And in fact, I think that it is really only part of the picture. What I think could be a start for a regulation, um, and I'm very much in favor of what I call the bookends approach, meaning that you have a regulatory approach and you also have the ability, at least for, for areas where it's really, really hard to regulate because it's so new, is to combine a regulatory approach with a tort-based approach, meaning that a person still could bring a cause of action when they have been harmed and they can connect the basis of that duty, so what somebody was supposed to do that they failed to do that caused the harm, you can actually connect that duty to something statutorily. Um, in the negligence space, we sometimes call this negligence per se, um, but this might be slightly different because it would require some interpretation of the regulation. So what are some things I'd like to see? Well, for deep learning or neural network-based complex AI, um, in a previous um, paper that I wrote called Beyond the Black Box, I advocated for this also, which is hosting a version of the actual algorithm for adverse testing. Um, black box testing is very common in software development, in cybersecurity related applications. The idea is that you would expose the algorithm so that folks could at least see what comes out of it. Um, now this wouldn't have to be the version that is actually being used in practice, but it should be um, reflective of the version that's used in practice to start to identify potential issues. So it's kind of like, um, those of you who might be familiar with a bug bounty or something like that, this would just be totally open. Um, so security researchers and others could actually test it. I also would like to require governance structures. Um, so create some known processes that we know will reduce safety concerns. There's been a ton of development in this space. Um, a lot of scientists, engineers, and data scientists have developed so much of this already that we just don't talk about. Um, ultimately, if we have key processes that we know that good entities should use, we should at least include them in a generalistic way. We don't have to offer all of the specifics, but the fact that they should be conducting certain types of processes and have um, a way of evaluating the outcomes of those processes and raising them up through the organization, very important. Um, internal fairness testing, a lot of folks have written on fairness and AI. I think this is something that's very doable. Um, include some privacy obligations related to personal information because we know personal information will be used rather extensively in AI. 
um, and that AI also creates new types of risks for that personal information based on inferences um, that a variety of different data, even if they aren't individually identifiable, collectively could identify an individual or sensitive characteristics about that person. Um, we also need to include cybersecurity obligations or potentially a certification mandate related to protecting these types of products. Um, it is very likely, and we're already starting to see it, that uh, a variety of different attackers, whether they're nation state oriented or non-nation state folks, um, will be looking to break a lot of these systems. Um, and limit the use of humans in the loop. So I think that we should start from a perspective that you are not creating something that is designed to be used with a human in the loop. If you want to use a human in the loop, I think that you have to meet additional criteria um, and demonstrate that you have included um, consideration of human factors or the user interface, how this person is supposed to work with the AI and what errors look like from the perspective of an AI, uh, from uh, a human perspective. Um, and I won't go through all of the other details here. We can talk about it if folks have questions about it. Um, but I realize this is not perfect. Of course, this paper is a work in progress. I'm still working on it. So ideas you have are welcome. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte. So if you could, uh, yeah, thanks, Un unshare. Uh, well, we'll open the floor. We've got about 20 minutes. Uh, so uh, Xiao Yi, why don't you lead off with a question? Yeah, thank you so much, Charlotte. I really like your talk. I learned a lot because, uh, you know, I'm not a TORT uh, scholar, so uh, I learned a lot from a TORT perspective this time. Yeah, let me. Yeah, I have two questions because I'm really curious about the answer. One is that uh, you, you mentioned like uh, AI is a product. Are they really product? Because I think uh, um, like they are intelligence product, if you think they are product. I'm curious your thoughts about that. Because uh, in my opinion, I don't think that they are like a product. And I think if we treat them like product, it's a little dangerous, have a lot of risk. I'm really curious about your, your thoughts about that. And the second one is about, uh, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, uh, tooling test. I'm curious. The thing about tooling test is that uh, it's very super, uh, super visual. Like it's just a uh, care about uh, communication part. I think uh, that's a uh, main focus. I'm curious, like, uh, like some other scholar mentioned, like uh, maybe you can have advanced uh, tests. You also mentioned the fairness test, some other test. I was thinking like, uh, uh, and I was wondering, do you think there's any test that uh, most advanced, uh, like, uh, I don't know, useful, not only care about the super uh, visual part, uh, but have some real uh, meaning uh, for the next step for the AI development? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. So I'll start with the product side. Um, I want to first start that, you know, I, I think the challenge is when we use the terminology product, we bring with it sort of our commercial understanding of products. Um, one thing that I will share, at least in the software space, is that we use product and software interchangeably. And usually it becomes a product per se, at least the way we talk about it, when we start licensing or selling it. When it becomes something we can, at least in, in the olden days before everything was digital and everything was an application or a web app or something like that, you know, we had actual physical boxes where it was like, here, here is your software, and then you would install it on your computer, but there was a physicality to it. I think the challenge is that as we become more and more virtual, the concept of software and technology has become more abstract. And with that, we've sort of diver divorced, uh, divorced ourselves sort of from this idea that software is a product. Um, there are a lot of folks, in, and actually I'm involved in a different initiative related to um, sort of the analysis of, of software. And do we think that this is gonna fall from a liability perspective more on the, the negligence side of the product side? And I think that by and large, most of us are kind of thinking about it as a product because there's a way to sort of differentiate where it starts and where it ends. And because at least for these types of applications, it will involve some kind of a financial structure, which could involve selling it to certain organizations to include it then in their products, et cetera. Now, I would have a harder time saying like open code, open source code is a product. Because in that particular case, we're offering it for free. Maybe there is a part of it that is delimited, but it's, it's not um, as clearly packaged. So I think that's why, um, along with some of the, what I foresee are kind of legal 
uh, benefits of using a product-based approach is why I'm calling it a product. Um, from the test perspective, so um, I actually don't think the Turing test is particularly useful for what we're doing. I think that we are going to have computers that are going to, in fact, we are probably already do in a lot of the chat functions we have that simulate humans very well. And from a Turing test perspective, probably are going to do pretty well. <laughs> but that doesn't mean, at least in my opinion, that you know, we should stop them from developing or they shouldn't be available. I think that it's more a question of how do we really challenge how they're developed? So I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm less concerned about how they function and more concerned about how they're created um, and how they're created in relation to how we expect they will function. This is how we've thought about software development since the beginning of time, right? You're designing for something. One of the challenges that I'm facing, and I, I, I kind of referenced it in the talk, I think, is the idea that AI could be applicable to a variety of different environments, a variety of different uses, and that we might potentially have um, AI that's marketed and then use it things we don't expect. So I, I think that labeling um, and warnings will be extremely important for AI so that we know what things are really designed for and what they're not designed for. Um, and I think that, that that's sort of the root. Ultimately, there could be other tests that, that fall underneath that. But if we don't know what AI are supposed to be used for as just a very basic matter, and we can't evaluate that, it's really hard for them to survive or for that organization to survive any of the other tests that we might want to offer. I don't know if that answers the question, but I really appreciate the question. Great, thank you. Roger, Roger Ford. Thanks. Um, I, super fascinating talk. Um, and I, I have not had a chance to look at the paper yet, but I look forward to doing so. I, I guess I have a couple of, um, I think, clarifying questions or sort of like um, questions that are sort of designed to sharpen terms, because I think they matter for some of your policy implications, and I'm not sure quite where you fall on them. So I guess one is, what are you thinking of as AI in the first place, right? Because like AI is a term of, you know, notoriously flexible meaning. AI is always kind of the thing that's just beyond what we think we can do now, except now it seems to be something we can actually do. But I think of things like handwriting recognition or, or you know, machine translation as sort of classic AI tasks that are now kind of solved, right? Um, and I think this matters for something like your warning proposal, where you're talking about like, you might have to label something that has AI built into it. Well, I mean, I can see that being a lot of things that are fairly conventional today. And, and so I could see that becoming sort of like consumers becoming sort of blind to it because everything will have that label. Um, and I, I, I think the other one is, I guess, what's in your mind the, the line between in the loop and out of the loop? Because I think I agree with you that there's, there's sort of problems with having humans in the loop too often because a lot of the value of these tools is in things where having a human in the decision-making loop becomes, um, you know, an obstacle. So like processing data too quickly or too much data or, you know, black box algorithms or things like that where humans don't really have enough time or information to have a meaningful say. Um, but then like you included like review as a thing that is an example of humans in the loop. And I think of that as sort of an after the fact process of like updating algorithms and making sure that they remain viable and everything. So I guess I'm I'm not sure what your, your thinking is there. Yeah, I, I think these are really two awesome points and they're things I've been thinking about. Someone else actually brought up um, the first one like just last week. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do I how do I kind of bring this in? Do I want to defer to the definition of AI from the new presidential executive order? Do I, you know, kind of what do I want to choose? Uh, I'll say that at least my gut feeling is I am more concerned about complex AI. So neural networks and deep learning applications, at least today, maybe in the future, that's going to be general artificial intelligence, but that's pretty far off, I think. Um, I'm less concerned about let's say very basic machine learning implementations that are highly supervised. So mainly I'm concerned about the things that would be very hard to reverse engineer. And I'm not sure exactly how to define that. 
Um, and the reason that I'm more concerned about those is because of the information diffusion problems. Information bias is going to, or automation bias is going to apply regardless of the type of AI. But if we're going to levy some pretty, um, let's say, strong requirements on an organization, I don't know that I'm going to care as much about handwriting detection as I am about something that um, would be very, very difficult for, let's say, um, boy, a consumer safety organization to figure out just by using something. Um, and that's me, like, my concern. So if you have ideas, I welcome. Yeah, let me let me poke back quickly at that. Like, is is this really about complexity of the of the AI tools, or is this about sort of risk level of the use? Oh, that's a very good question. I I mean, I think it's both. Because like I could imagine a really yeah. complicated handwriting recognition algorithm, right? That's true. That's true. And and ultimately, I mean, that's that's the way that the EU EU has chosen to regulate is based on risk. And I'm not opposed to that. I think the challenge that I'm facing is, you know, again, the AI could be used for a variety of different purposes. So if we slot it as being low risk, but then we use it in a high risk application, yeah. does it now then become high risk? How do we evaluate that? And the only reason I mention this is because the same thing has happened with medical devices. You might have one component of a medical device that's like a class one low risk, and now it's included in like a knee replacement function. It causes the whole thing to fail. The joint replacement function is, you know, class three, but that part was never evaluated as part of that system because it was already categorized as class one. So I worry about sort of this componentization of AI that could potentially happen. But I share your thoughts on, you know, I, what we care about are high risk things. We're not caring about things that are low risk. But I yeah, think we also my, like, care about things that you can't avoid. <laughs> like my first, my first instinct was to think that it's something about like, whether the AI is sort of driving an action that happens in the physical world without human intervention or something like that. But then I was thinking, well, that can't be right because something like identifying a cancer is high risk, but it doesn't have that. It's only providing information output that a human does something with. So yeah, I think it's really hard. Um, well, I'm anyway. think about that. And I hope I will come up with a useful, a useful approach. Uh, but the second one is sort of the, the in the loop versus outside of the loop. Um, and I agree, I, I was sort of on the fence about the part um, where I talk about review, because that can look an awful lot like overall testing and tuning. I think the difference is that that kind of review is used on a live application versus all of the steps that are taken to improve something for the next release or something that has done in, in advance of something being in production. So I'm thinking more about, I guess, the maybe the the relative expertise of the people who are doing it. So I'm going to think more about that and kind of whether I want to include that or not, because I would imagine that even in a review function, like let's take content moderation. The person who's doing the reviewing probably doesn't really understand much about the AI and how it's functioning. Oh, I see your point. Yeah. You know, um, but at the same time, let's say that we're opening something up to broad testing, how would that be outside of the loop if content moderation would be in the loop? Yeah, review well, is sort of about that. appealing the direct decision versus review is, yeah, okay. Let me think on that a little bit more, but I really appreciate the thoughts. You've got me thinking, both of you. So I'm gonna jump in and and claim the moderator's privilege to, to All right. the lob. <laughs> it may turn out to be the last question of the hour, we'll see. Um, so I want to maybe push a little bit on the kind of AI exceptionalism as the framing for the paper, meaning um, in a lot of ways, sort of the you, know, you were a little explicit about this towards the end of the talk and kind of implicit leading up to it in the sense that the macro, the macro framing here is a balance between new, innovative, complicated technology that humans interact with in all kinds of dynamic and complicated ways and harm that needs to be compensated and deterred in some respects. So that's kind of an, an overarching framing. And if that's the overarching framing, right, innovation compensation, then there's nothing really unique or special about AI in historical context, meaning we've had big transformative technological introductions through the last 150 years, just to take that framing, right? Railroads, automobiles, 
distribution of electricity, the assembly line and factory production, and then you could get into health, antibiotics, vaccines, and so forth, each of which were extremely innovative, socially powerful, but also created uh, you know, complicated and difficult to parse risks of harm. And two things are notable in that framing generally. One, um, tort law innovated. Right. We didn't just pick things off the shelf and figure out whether it's negligence or something else. We had to come up with products liability. We had to come up with strict liability um, Two, um, markets innovated. Right. So the big innovation across all of those things was risk pooling. Sometimes risk pooling emerged because of innovation in legal doctrine. Sometimes risk pooling emerged because private markets figured out how to insure against the risks certification processes, private insurance, public regulation as a form of insurance and so forth. And so so if, if you buy my setup, you don't have to, but if you buy the setup, then the AI instance, right, is a case study of this larger model. And then the question is, what's new and different about the case, right? What do we learn about the AI experience that we didn't already know from studying what railroads did and what we did with automobiles and what we did with electricity, where there's an enormous amount of literature, right? in law and public policy and history and science and technology studies about how those things were socially transformative, but harmful in some cases, and we had to figure out how to blend those things. So I guess it's really a framing question for you. Is the best paper here really AI is new and different than this has never happened before, and so we have to uh -huh. come up with a few things, or yeah. this is a really, really profound and important case study of something that we actually already know a lot about? Hmm. I think that because, you know, um, as those of us who have seen other introductions of other technologies over time, AI is not a brand new thing, right? I lived through the dot-com bubble. I lived through the beginning of the internet. <laughs> you know, I remember when I was really excited that I created a website that had like a uh, um, uh, an animated GIF, you know, like, <laughs> so part of me is, is kind of in this camp of there's nothing new under the sea, right? But th this is representative of large foundational sociologically changing um, circumstances. So I, I think I'm, I think I'm in that camp. I think that there are some things that are really unusual about AI that are not as similar to, let's say, software models or applications that we've seen in the past. I think, so maybe at a macro level, I think I'm with you. I think there are, you know, the, um, the industrial revolution, of course, was, you know, incredibly transformative. And there have been a lot of people who have talked about this as like an, another coming of the industrial revolution in, in a different way. Um, but at least in sort of the computer space, there are some things that are just very unusual and different about it. In particular, the unexpected ways that it functions that are really hard to determine by investing upfront. And maybe that's something that I need to spend more time on um, because this idea of insulating um, through, for example, insurance liability related to strict liability, um, purchasing insurance that you know is going to offset what that liability could be, investment upfront potentially to, um, you know, for insurance companies to actually drive from a signal perspective that organizations are doing the right thing, a kind of that model, which we've seen be relatively effective in other spaces. I don't know if it's as effective here, probably for a couple of reasons. One is because there are some things that we just won't be able to anticipate. And so if we, if we want insurers to actually be willing to pay out, they need some degree of control over what is going to happen or, or be able to anticipate it. This is part of why a lot of insurers have gotten out of the cyber liability, cyber risk game. Because even though that's fairly knowable from a data perspective, it's really hard to put a dollar amount on and can result in pretty significant um, payouts. So, Anyway, I need to do more thinking on that, Mike. I think it's a really great perspective. Um, probably part of my next step will be thinking about rewriting this paper from, you know, may maybe this is the new framing. Um, I'm definitely not an AI exceptionalist. I will tell you that. <laughs> so if that's coming across, that is not what I want to come across. But I have to figure out what the alternative framing kind of could be.
Well, I, I didn't I didn't mean to suggest that you were an AI exceptionalist in the oh, sense no. that you're a celebrant. Only there's a <laughs> the, it, some of what comes across is that this is a unique and and, and different thing compared yeah. to what we already know, and that might be something to to reflect on going yeah. forward. I I agree. <laughs> Okay, um, we're at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna officially uh, call a halt and thank you, Charlotte, for the paper and thank everybody else for staying with us today. I uh, appreciate all of your time and energy. And I'm gonna ask Ali to, uh, to turn off the recording, but we can stick around for a moment.